it will be on a virtual experiments where we demonstrate or show some of uh, the work that's been done with the simulation packages uh, and publish at least most of it for our show. So we are not only going to mention work that's been done with Maxas, but also some of the other packages that are uh, used today or has been. These are not all mentioned in this talk, but these are the full bunch of software that you might uh, have heard of. And I also think they were mentioned by Peter earlier in the week, so I'm not going through them all. But common to all of them is that they are a general purpose. They try to allow you to do everything that's relevant. And they have really become standard tools of the trade. And almost no instrument is designed without the use of at least one of these. And so my supervisor, oh, something has gone wrong with this slide. Big might be able to I think I can show it like this instead because we need the labels here that were gone. But my supervisor at the University of Copenhagen from when I did my PhD, Kim Lefman, made a um, publication or meta analysis of which papers have been citing the um, original papers of the different simulation packages and what did they do in those papers. <coughs> well, a lot of it is uh, new concepts of instruments, but the majority, is, or at least the largest category, is the design of instrumentation and some sort of report about a new design. Then there are also uh, some papers on, on upgrades of instruments and how, how much better the new instrument will be based on Monte Carlo simulation. Then we have a small amount of these global optimizations, which are often really possible in the computer because you will do an optimization over a whole facility to change something that's common to that entire facility. Then these here are instrument optimizations where numerical methods have been used in uh, conjunction with Monte Carlo to optimize that instrument. And then, what is this category? Some of that's missing too. I think this is the start of the. Um, so that must be the instrument paper. Yes, that's a big category. So, when you go to uh, your instrument, this is the paper that you should cite if you have data from it and you want to show it in a publication. All of these instrument papers, they include a simulation of the instrument, and so we get a lot of citations from that kind of publication. Now the rest, uh, we have this VE in the title, and it stands for Virtual Experiment. And the requirements for that is that it has to be simulating some real intensity that can be compared to real data. It has to use a sample at the sample precision uh, and attempt to provide the data in a realistic way. So something that you can actually measure, not the cheating monitors, but something that you can use regular data analysis tools. And we have some basic ones. Then we have some benchmarks that try to check how well are the simulations performing in comparison to reality. Then there are uh, full data analysis experiments. And here um, it is a, a comparison to a real experiment. These are very important for us to understand whether or not our code is doing the right thing or not. And then we have a group of papers about resolution of an instrument and maybe a comparison to a real resolution or just using simulation to understand the resolution function of the instrument. <coughs> so this is an uh, overview of the different kinds of applications you can use Monte Carlo simulation. Oh, one important note is we've actually ex 
excluded a few categories. Uh, so papers only mentioning new software tools, and papers only mentioning new components from Maxdas or modules for the test, and then papers only about objects. These are not included in this. This is just about full instrument simulations. So there's also many papers on these subjects. And now I think we can go back to the full screen. Great. So now I'll run through some examples of the, or one example or two from each category to show you what kind of work is being performed. The first one here is from Jochen Stahl and Uwe Filkis, to be a sponsor from PSI. And they are talking about this uh, Selena prototype that they have installed on their reflectometry, reflectometer armor. And they're using a, a real focusing mirror to focus down on the sample. And they get, uh, they can make a, a perfect simulation and they see, oh, that doesn't quite match our experiment. And then they try to adjust a few parameters and they see, oh, if we misalign it slightly, we get these lines and they correspond very well to reality. So they can go in and see uh, that the alignment of the system was actually really crucial. And why wouldn't it be when you're talking about perfectly focusing objects? Then we have uh, a concept of the dream powder instrument for ESS. Uh, designed by a German group and they, they do their full instrument simulation <coughs> with, with choppers and bispectral <coughs> extraction and they were using a uh, test for this and this is the kind of work that's needed in order to ensure that uh, it would be selected for construction at ESS and indeed this uh, instrument is under construction. Here are some of their uh, results. They, they will do 2D data analysis on the, on the power spectrum. Normally, you just take a line out here and integrate over that. But they will try to integrate over the entire line, which will also be done at the handle. In fact, some of also on the construction basis. And they also use simulation to compare to other prominent instruments and show that, of course, that's much better. Then an example from the global optimization category. This was actually done in the group I earned my PhD in, but before I entered the group. Uh, so all my office mates almost, and then uh, this is the um, leader of the BTS package as well, which was also uh, collaborated. And what we did, or they did, was that they, they made a quick idea of which kind of instruments would be at a future ESS. This was way back before it was decided how the source would be built. And then they wanted to optimize what kind of time structure should we have uh, for the source and, and how well would our instrument perform. So they, they did the simulation of all these instruments and tried to optimize them for different pulse times, um, no repetition rates, and uh, pulse times. And then they saw how much performance they would get compared to their baseline, which was 60 hertz to, <coughs> 60 hertz to milliseconds. And here's an example of one of these instruments. And they even noted that uh, the, the 12 by 12 moderator wasn't quite um, necessary. Only a small area in the middle was actually being used for a lot of the instruments. And here are some of the results. They found that the performance of the general instrument suite could be approximated by a certain function given the, pulse time, the repetition rate over the pulse time. And so this was used to select the uh, repetition rate and pulse time of the final source. In a similar way, it was used when ESS years later realized that if you make the moderator smaller, you can 
you gain an increased brilliance. And then it was suddenly necessary to re-optimize all the optics to see if we could gain a benefit from this. And they didn't just offer one alternative moderator size, they offered something like 10. And we could really see that if you go down to a one millimeter high source, you could gain an enormous amount of brilliance. But of course you would lose intensity because the area would decrease. So, I was part of a small group that investigated whether or not this could actually be a benefit. And we did this by, again, simulating the objects of all instruments for all these moderator heights. And here is an example from the NMX, a biomolecular diffractometer. And we see when the moderator size decreases, the brilliance transfer the fraction of the useful brilliance that reach the sample decreases at some point. But of course the red line is the brilliance of the source. It will just shoot up as we saw in the last slide. Depending a lot on the wavelength interval, but for this instrument it almost diverges. But of course the important thing is how much flux do we get in our sample. And that is the black line. That is the product of these two. And that has some optimal before we go down to a paper thin source. And for this instrument, that's around 2 centimeters for moderate. And then this was repeated for, for these many moderator heights for all the instruments that was even under consideration for being selected for construction at that point. And of course we used all the requirements for the beam size and divergence requirements and pin uh, pinhole positions of the choppers and wavelength interval to re reach the uh, reasonable conclusion. And the data was then presented like this, where for each category of instrumentation, all these figure merit curves were overlaid, and we can see a clear trend that we should definitely not have a large moderator we could have a something between 2 and 6 centimeters of the sand and reflectometry. They would really be happy with that all the way down to 2 centimeters. And so uh, an overall decision was made by uh, the steering committee about a, a 3 centimeter moderator height. And it's still wide, but only 3 centimeters <coughs> tall. It was even investigated if this result would change if you allow to start the guide closer to the source, you might think that that would counteract some of the lost brilliance, but actually it didn't give very much at our 3 centimeter selected height, and it would increase the risk a lot, because you have to water cool the guides at this kind of distance to a 5 megawatt proton target. So it was selected to keep the distance from the moderator to 2 meters and forfeit this more uh, gain in performance. Now we have some of the instrument papers. And this is uh, four seasons from JPAC, where they stimulate their um, intensity as a function of resolution. And of course they can adjust the resolution by the frequency of their choppers. And it luckily matched what they simulated before they built it, so they were happy. They did, however, have to scale the intensity. So they didn't quite get all the intensity they were expecting, but they got the correct resolution dependence that they were expecting. In a similar way, the, uh, the Sequoia instrument at SNS, they have simulated and measured their, their time response in a certain resolution <coughs> measure, and they got exactly the right intensity, but only on their fifth try or so, because they had forgot to take a lot of things into account when they designed the instrument, and then they added these after the instrument was built, and then they ended up with this nice agreement. The things they forgot were the aluminium windows, air in the beam, which has some scattering, 
the energy response of the monitor they used to uh, measure this data and also the electronic response time of this monitor. All of these were off at the start and they had to learn as they went to get this nice fit. But at the end they did it without an arbitrary scaling factor. And then I hope nothing arbitrary was in any of these parameters. There's also been uh, papers about this MAX instrument that I showed yesterday at NIST. And these papers talk about the uh, this side of the very complex monochromator and the equations governing their angles and position. And they, they did experiments and, and simulations and checked whether or not these equations would provide the best monochromator. And actually it turned out that it didn't. The red line here shows what the analytical solution would say is the best uh, parameter for the monochromator. But both the simulation and the experiment shows that no, actually, <coughs> sorry, that should be set a little lower than expected. And so they, they could have avoided doing the experiment and just build it like that from the start if they just trusted their simulations. But now at least we have a data set that shows the nice correlation. And here is a, another parameter of the monochromator where it shows the, the opposite, that this distance should actually be a little larger, and it's also true both for experiment and simulation. Then we have a, um, a benchmark virtual experiment that really attempts to compare with simulation. And this was also done at uh, our workplace at the University of Copenhagen by uh, Linda Ulby. And here is the Rita 2 triple axis instrument at PSI, which was moved from uh, the Danish reactor in Dissek. And it actually has seven analyzer plates. And here is a comparison between the intensity measured and simulated. It is, however, scaled by a factor of 0.55. And that factor was applied by measuring the flux with gold foil at the, near the source. Um, and this was the loss of flux compared to the optimal source calculations that were done. So it's not an arbitrary factor, but still different than what they expected when they did the simulations first. But then it also gets to fit really nicely. And here are some other measurements of uh, A4 scans over some different um, peaks at, in this uh, power. And it all seems to fit quite nicely. Another time where simulations and reality have had a little battle uh, was this uh, prismatic analyzer concept um, discovered by Jonas Markus Bier while he was designing the Camilla instrument. And he found that if your analyzer in a triple axis kind of setup is far away from the sample, then you actually get different energies at different angles. And during my monochromator talk, I, I also showed this in the simulation, that there's some correlation between divergence and angle. And he used that to make uh, some energy sensitivity by placing three detectors close to one another. And when he showed that to his supervisors and, and teammates and the instrument construction team, they disregarded this and said, oh, this might work in simulation. But it will never work in reality because of mosaicity and all of these other things. But when they simulated it, it all worked out, even when they included all of these things. So there was only one thing left to do, and that was to build a prototype in reality. And here is a comparison between the measured data and the next simulation, showing that 
It indeed does work exactly as the simulation said, and this is now uh, this discovery is included in the construction of new triple axis instruments and new uh, also the Camilla instrument, Bifrost instrument that it was intended for. So it, it, uh, the simulations can be surprisingly trustworthy. Um, if you find something funny in there, chances are that it's, it could work. Here we have an example of someone using uh, rest facts for simulating the resolution function and then applying that when during the fitting routine of the data. And it's some, some coarse data, so it's a little difficult to get the fit correct. But here we see the 2D model and the 2D data. It doesn't quite, there's no model down at the lowest energies, but from 16 milli electron volts and up, they get a very beautiful correspondence. And of course, this is with the model folded with the resolution that was calculated by the Monte Carlo simulation. And without this additional resolution, the model is, is way too accurate and have too narrow peaks, which can never really be fitted to the reality. Then we have a big virtual experiment on uh, both ARCS and Sequoia at the SNS, and they are investigating uranium nitride, where there is a all excitations have the same energy difference, <coughs> and this means that multiple scattering is very difficult to disentangle from the rest because uh, a two-level excitation could just be two one-level excitations. And so the simulated single scattering did not correspond well to, uh, to the reality, but adding the other scattering orders, we see some of the more scattering on the left here that is completely absent in the single scattering simulation. And here we see some comparison between their measurements and their simulation where they really did get a great accuracy. Even in the elastic regime, which is very difficult to get right, which we'll talk about later today, they have some great results. And I believe they even managed to improve a little bit on this by including some of the taking the mass of the uranium acid into account, which is normally considered to be infinite in these calculations, because of course the nitride is so much lighter. But this did improve their fit a bit. So, in summary of this publication analysis, people trust these simulation packages to a large extent, and are uh, entitled to do so after seeing a lot of these results where simulation has been used to great effect. We saw it see use both in facility level design decisions, instrument design, benchmark for instruments, and that's sometimes the other way around, that instead of benchmarking the simulation, people benchmark their instrument against the simulation and see, did we align our guides well, did we get all the intensity that we possibly could? If we got less than the simulation, perhaps we did. This might not be the best approach, but some papers are phrased like that. And we also see use in data analysis. And this is just in addition to the heavy use in neutral optics, where these tools are uh, obviously best suited. And we, we do expect to see continued growth, because the more and more people learn about these tools, the more people use them. And we also hope that, that the recent developments in MaxDAS, for example, the union components, will help uh, these tools see more use, in, for example, assembly environments. But uh, my talk is not quite done yet. I, uh, I wish to, uh, to add a little bit of my own work, where I have been comparing simulation and reality on the, the MARI powder spectrometer at ISIS which is of course very similar to the CSNS talks. 
So I thought that might be interesting here. And the Mari instrument is a little interesting because all the detectors are underneath the <coughs> underneath the cell instead of uh, around it, which is more normal. And this allows them to have some kind of strange sample environments, where the sample is situated down here next to a window, and then scattering happens underneath. So there's less material to go through, and it doesn't need to be able to support its own weight because it's lifted from above, so the material can be thinner. And here, of course, we see my simulation with the union components trying to replicate this geometry. Now, this is the first kind of disappointing comparison, but this is without any sample in, uh, in the sample environment, just an empty sample environment. And we do see some issues here. There's a much stronger drag peak in the measurement than in the simulation. And we believe this has to do with the way the aluminium has been treated, that it's been pressed together in order to obtain this very thin profile, but that does something to the orientation of the grains in the aluminum. So they don't have an isotropic distribution, and this can be very important for the intensity of the bright peaks in the different directions. And of course, had they known that, Maybe they would have tried to orient it in a different way so that they didn't get a much more powerful brack peak on their detectors than they actually thought they would. So here we see it with the intensities and the angles without the time of flight. And we see that the simulation is, uh, is just uh, a bit off. Well, we still tried to do a comparison between data from a sample and uh, the measurement and in this case there's a much better agreement of course the sample scatters more than the uh, prior stuff so this dominates the view but still the height of these correspond to the energy resolution which is matched very well there's an overall shift so that the simulation actually have the center a little bit lower in energy than uh, the real experiment and I think they simply renormalized so that they had their center of the peak in the middle where the simulation actually cares about the center of the poles but it has a long tail and this tail is more on the negative energy side than the positive so it's not quite centered at zero MeV. And here we compare the simulated and measured data, and we see this is the Bragg peak of aluminum at this energy. This is 35 millielectron volt. And we see only at the points of the aluminum lines do we have a discrepancy. Otherwise, things seem to be working out nicely. So if we do put some faith in this simulation, we can use it to advise the people doing experiments in Mari on, for example, which energies should they choose for their experiments. To do that, I simulated one simulation for a large number of incoming energies, and then I looked at the, uh, the scattering we would see from aluminum peaks, and this up here is the, the total amount of scattering we see with the uh, rack peaks at, uh, at 2 theta equal to their maximum detector angle. And we see the changes in measured intensity corresponds to that rack peak at their maximum detector angle. The multiple scattering, however, is the component that annoys their time of flight signal. And those peaks are not aligned with the same 2 theta equal detector bank, but that's just 2 theta equal 180 degrees. So the multiple scattering is actually dominated by backscattering, because these can travel past the sample multiple times in the empty sample environment. And if we could include the, uh, the energy uh, of this type of plot, 
we see this is all our aluminium black lines. They follow Bragg's law as they should. And then here the background looks nice and uniform. But if we remove all the single scattering and only look at multiple scattering, <laughs> we see the problems. And actually, they have found some energies that they would measure on regularly. One of them, as we saw, was 35. And that's a relatively quiet area in terms of background. They also had another one at 12 that they liked, and that's also a relatively quiet area. And now I've provided them a map to find the, the good quiet areas in their background where it's easier to take measurements because multiple scattering is less important. And they're actually quite happy for that. We can also look at a single energy. This is uh, 35 milli electron volt where they did their measurements for the experiment I uh, got data from. I didn't participate in the experiment. And here we see the aluminum black beads and we have sort of zoomed in with the energy scale to um, 2 to 7 orders of magnitude we so below the aluminum black beads. And we see some weird ghost black peaks up in the background. And this can actually be 10 milli electron volts away from the black peaks, which is quite something for the resolution of the instrument. And these can be uh, perhaps removed by a shielding. We did actually not simulate all the shielding that they had at the instrument. They only told us about some of it after we've done these simulations. So I am, have it on my to-do list to redo it with more of their shielding and see if this goes away. But until then, we can look at that image for all the different energies that was in the previous plot and see a little movie of how the background evolves with energy. And every time a new black peak enters, we get a new scurrier like this. And with higher energy, they move over. And then we collect them in this area where at higher and higher energies, we have more and more black peaks and then more and more scurriers available. Uh, of course, their importance decreases when they are grouped together and their intensity decreases because other bright peaks are available, so a lower fraction of the beam goes to that particular point. And at high enough energies, we can actually resolve the difference between the entrance, and the exit, and the sample aluminium because there are three different points in space and we can at the very highest energy is actually resolve them. So the height of this peak is um, dependent on the width of the sample environment. If they had made that a lot wide, they would have been able to see the sample alone. Had they made them narrower, it would perhaps not annoy as much in this uh, low energy gain region. So there are some trade-offs between how you design the sample environment and what measurements you get. And now we are at the actual end of the talk where I just did some quick uh, conclusions on my own work. And that is again, that it's really difficult to get a correct simulation of all aspects of the instrument that have something to do with background. But it does provide some benefits if you actually do simulate the background because you can learn about where is your instrument best suited for measurements and are there just areas of, of our parameters of space that we should avoid because we get just a higher background in this area and there's no reason to waste time measuring that.